Today marks the first installment of Richard Matheson Rules. Let's get to it, shall we? Hold it. Hold it. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. Rod Serling helpfully sets up the first story by telling us about an experimental spaceflight that just crashed to Earth. We then meet Rod Taylor, I mean, Bizarro Robin Williams, I mean, Colonel Forbes, one of the pilots of the X-20 spacecraft, who goes to visit his fellow pilot, Major Gart. He asks Gart how he's feeling, and Gart says, Are you serious? You know, one more thermometer in my puss, I'm going to absent myself without leave from this establishment. <laughs> I'm sorry, a thermometer in your what now? You know, one more thermometer in my puss- Dude, you're gonna get me demonetized with language like that. Anyway, after sharing a hospital room smoke because 1959, Forbes is clearly nervous about something and tries to explain it to Gart without sounding like a lunatic. Alas, he fails, ranting about how there's something wrong with the newspaper because it only shows two pilots. You see, according to Forbes, there were three including his friend of 15 years, Colonel Ed Harrington. Unfortunately, despite Forbes' best efforts, Gart doesn't remember a third man. Clegg, I don't know anybody named Harrington. I'm not sure exactly what's going on here, but I'm guessing it has something to do with time travel. Gart wants to call in the nurse to get Forbes some help, but Forbes stops him, insisting that Gart sit through a flashback first. We then see the three survivors of the crash the afternoon prior, as both Forbes and Harrington leave their friend to recover before going to a bar. They get free drinks, and Forbes gets a perfect setup, only to deliver a pickup line even worse than a thermometer in your p What's it like up there in outer space? Uh, well, <clears throat> it's, it's like, uh, like, way out. Somehow, this works, and as Forbes continues flirting, the sight of it apparently makes Harrington sick. He spills his drink, only to get another one on the house. Well, that's okay, that's okay. That ain't the last glass of beer in the place. Where is this magical bar? I'll gladly go to space for a couple hours if it means infinite free drafts. Actually, knowing my luck, it would probably be Bud Light. Ugh. Ed says he's not sick, but he does feel weird, especially framed against a slowly flashing light. He then suddenly decides to call his parents from the phone booth that is conveniently placed in the room. Afterwards, he calls Forbes over to tell him what happened. His own parents denied they ever had a son. Ed talks about how he feels like they shouldn't have come back from the flight. Forbes offers to help him feel better by getting him another drink. But he then sees the newspaper, which doesn't have Harrington on it. You got a beer here, honey. You know what? Forget about Ed. I got a beer to attend to. Instead of taking the hint, Forbes argues with the bartender, who insists he came in alone. And then Forbes starts shouting, engaging in what we call projection. You're crazy! You know that? You're, you're crazy! Back at his home, he gets berated by his wife. You were married this whole time? You dirty dog, Forbes. He tries to explain it all to her, but she, of course, has never heard of Ed Harrington. He calls his old commanding officer, who also doesn't remember Harrington. In a perfectly reasonable tone of voice, Forbes then shouts at the general and slams the phone down. Now fully breaking down, Forbes runs to the bar, breaks in, knocks over some chairs, and starts crying in the phone booth. <laughs> Please, Ed. Please come back. <laughs> the flashback ends, but Major Gart still doesn't remember Harrington and still wants Forbes to get some help. Forbes then concludes that Ed must have been taken away, and then he starts to get that tingle in his brain and runs off, convinced he's about to be taken too. People are going to come for you too. What are you going to do? <laughs> Gart chases him out to the hallway, but Forbes is gone. And when the nurse offers to help, she tells him she has no idea who he's talking about, that Gart 
was always alone. The Major starts freaking out and sees the paper, which now only has him in the picture. The nurse comes back later, but Gart is gone and she doesn't remember anybody being in the room. Even the experimental X-20 is gone. I friggin' love this episode. No real explanation, no big reveal, just this is what's happening and there's nothing anybody can do about it. There's the hint of aliens maybe being responsible, but it would have to be extremely advanced aliens, capable of warping reality itself, such that they're not only abducting the pilots, but erasing them from reality, like Doctor Strange did with that nameless kid. Chappy? No, I'm annoyed. It's also really well paced, not lingering too long on what's up with the colonel at the start, and then drip-feeding us the exposition we need to understand the real horror of the situation. I also love Bizarro Robin Williams. That guy can act. Ha! There's the man. I'm out of coffee! Out of coffee? What a time to run out. And why run out? Now there's a new giant size instant Maxwell House. A really big jar of coffee. We start our second episode in yet another bar, where one man, Fred Renard, sits around bored, wallowing in his own sociopathy. He tells the bartender to leave him alone. All kinds. We get all kinds. Just as another guy, Pedot, walks in. This little old man carries a case of trinkets that he sells to the customers, but it quickly becomes apparent that this is no ordinary salesman, as he displays an apparently precognitive ability to discern what a person really needs. I think I know what it is you need. What is it? Cleaning fluid. Okay, yeah, that sounds like some 1950s sexism, but the truth is that that femme fatale, let's call her Annie, has bloodstains on her carpet. <coughs> Pedot glares ominously at Renard before getting noticed by Lefty, the pro pitcher forced into retirement for a bum arm. Pedot uses his magic powers to discern that Lefty needs a free bus ticket to Scranton for some reason. After Lefty and the bartender have a good chuckle about how awful Scranton is, Lefty takes a call in the phone booth. N now wait a minute, seriously, what is up with these full-fledged phone booths in bars? Was that a common thing in the old days? Long story short, it turns out Lefty has been offered a coaching gig in Scranton, because every job offer phone call always goes to a bar, meaning he really does need that bus ticket. Not only that, but he has a stain on his only suit jacket. But wouldn't you know it, there's a lonely woman right there who just happens to have some cleaning fluid. While everybody else seems to chalk it up to a wild coincidence, Renard stares at Pedot, an idea swirling around in his head. Pedot looks back, concerned, and then runs off in a hurry, but Renard follows him outside, where he demands to be given what he needs. By the way, this episode, What You Need, may have the record for the most title drops in half an hour. I'll tell you what you need. It's what you need. Oh, tell him, Lefty. Tell him what you need. Tell him what you need. They're what you need. I'll tell you what you need. This is what you need. Pedot grabs some scissors, but rather than stabbing Renard in the neck with them, as he probably should, Pedot assures him that they are what he needs. Renard later gets his scarf stuck in the elevator doors as the elevator very slowly starts to rise. Rather than just taking off the scarf like a normal person, Renard reaches for his new pair of scissors to free himself from his predicament. That's just what I needed. Just what I needed. Just what I needed. Later that night, Renard breaks into the old man's apartment, and Pedot, despite his ability to see the future, is surprised to find him there. Renard then gets exceptionally rude and explains that he is partnering with Pedot to use his powers for personal gain. I'm guessing you won't be surprised to learn that the actor who plays Renard, Steve Cochran, was a character actor well known for playing gangsters. What satisfies him comes long and low and drives in four wheels. Comes from expensive shops, looks uptown. Luxury, Papa. Luxury. Renard bullies Pedot into once again giving him what he needs, which this time turns out to be a leaky fountain pen that drips on the name of a winning horse. 
After winning big, he leaves $250 lying around in plain sight as the doorman shows up with the next day's paper. Uh, did you ever hear of a tip? A tip? Oh yeah, here's a tip. Don't play with matches. You know he's real bad news because he's rude to service staff. Renard, under the bizarre impression that the same trick will work twice, finds that the pen no longer drips ink, and he gets so mad about it, he starts stuffing crumpled up money into his pockets. He then confronts Pedot again, isn't phased that the old man knows his name, and begins really threatening him by telling him his sad backstory. I was born under a lousy zodiac or something. I've been getting the dirty end of the stick ever since I was four years old. I feel sorry for you. Under duress, Pedot gives one last warning before looking over at a box, which Renard then takes, finding a pair of slick shoes. Renard is convinced everything is going to come up aces, even though the shoes don't fit right, and Pedot walks across the street. Renard gets angry again when Pedot tells him the shoes aren't what he needs, they are what Pedot needs. Renard starts to cross, slips, and then gets run over by a car. Do the jaywalk, get the outline chalk. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. That, that, was, that was really bad, I'm sorry. This is a fun little episode that really exploits a simple writing trick. I don't mean that as a negative, because you really do get a good dopamine hit every time one of Pedot's items proves useful. I'll even say that it's an episode that benefits from multiple viewings, because you much more clearly understand the old man's obvious fear upon seeing Renard. And it's not just because Renard can make cigarette smoke go backwards. And that's all I have on And When the Sky Was Opened and What You Need. Now, as always, do all those YouTubey things, check out my Patreon, and all that other good stuff. But until next time, this is the Unapologetic Geek telling you to never be ashamed of what you love. As long as you're not hurting anybody. One more thermometer in my pussy.